This video is the first one I've recorded using a new setup using a rock chip and a new microphone. I hope the quality will be better than I was getting under Windows. The video is about the austerity program of the British government, but much of it probably applies to issues about the national debt in the United States as well. So I'm talking about why Reeves austerity program is unlikely to work. We had Starmer in Parliament talking about the need to make hard decisions. And talking about hard decisions sounds to me an awful like a rerun of austerity. There are echoes of what the David Cameron uh, government was saying when they came in. But who is this going to be austerity for? Is it going to be austerity for those on low incomes, as it was with the Tories? Or will it be austerity for the rich, as it was with the previous Labour government? Under the Attlee government, Cripps was Lord Chancellor. Well, not Lord Chancellor, Chancellor of the Exchequer. He was a social democrat and not a, a communist or anything, but his approach to the whole budget was radically different to that of the current chancellor. And I'm going to bring it out just to show how much of a contrast there is between a social democratic approach to this and a neoliberal approach. Reeves is focusing on money and the government budget at deficit, saying there's a 22 billion black hole. Cripps, on the other hand, focused on the trade deficit of the whole nation. That is to say, not just what the government was doing and how to fix it. Rees proposed to make savings by cutting benefits to pensioners whilst giving billions to Zelensky. Cripps cut defence and directed it to housing and the newly established and expensive National Health Service. Reeves essentially is protecting the rich, as far as we can tell, by promising not to raise income tax, therefore not raising the top rate of income tax, which is currently 48%. Cripps, on the other hand, followed a soak the rich policy and raised the top rate of income tax on the highest incomes to just over 97%, confiscatory levels of taxation on high incomes. Now let's look at what he said about his import programme, and I'm quoting what he wrote, he, he said in Hansard. Our import programme is based up on three principles. The first is to buy as little as possible from countries to whom we must pay dollars or gold. The second is to buy the minimum of food necessary to maintain a healthy standard. And the third is to buy the minimum of raw materials to enable us to maintain a high level of industrial activity. What we have, therefore, was an austerity focused around the vital needs of the public and of industry. Back in the 40s and 50s, coal was actually rationed. But Reeves isn't cutting winter fuel allowances because she's worried that pensioners are squandering fuel. She's doing it just to save money. And the question is why? Because fuel is something real. Whereas money is just something that is an entry in a computer ledger. Cripps was focused on the trade deficit. Reeves doesn't even think it's important, doesn't mention it. She's only concerned about the public sector deficit. But why was the trade deficit considered more important then? The UK government and the Bank of England could, in principle, issue as many pound notes as it wanted. But it couldn't issue the dollars and gold required to pay for imports. Thus, 
dollars and gold constituted a hard limit on the imports the country could make. That was the situation right up until the beginning of the 1970s when the when Cripps was writing a pound was worth four dollars which allowing for the dollar being tied to the uh, gold meant a pound was worth 0 0.16 ounces of gold. In 1971 the Tories floated the pound and removed it from any fixed ratio to gold. Free market economists claimed at the time that this was a great advance. They said that floating the exchange rate would automatically bring trade into balance, bring the remove for all time the need for the government to worry about trade deficits. They said if there was a surplus of imports, the pound would fall and that would automatically boost exports. The magic of the market would make it all work out. Well, that was the story that free market economists promoted back in the 70s in the Selsden Man period of the Heath government, which was pre-Thatcherism before Thatcherism. What actually happened? Well... This shows, the bottom graph shows the trade deficit or the balance of trade as a percentage of GDP. And you can see that whilst there was tiny trade, or what now seem tiny trade deficits during the 1960s, things changed once they floated. We got, went into a wild oscillation. But it was a wild oscillation that has been dominated by deficits. There was a brief period during the 1980s when North Sea oil allowed a trade surplus to develop. But the claims by the free market economists that this would automatically equilibrate didn't occur. A trade surplus did, did happen. And when the North Sea oil ran out, there has been a persistent trade deficit. So the whole experiment of floating exchange rates as a means to st stop worrying about the balance of trade doesn't mean you stop worrying about the balance of trade because it's fixed. It just means that under the neoliberal order, the government absolves itself of any responsibility for the trade balance. But it still ha operates. It still has an effect. So let's look at another way of analysing it. Don't just look at the trade deficit. Don't just look at the public sector deficit. But look how they all interact. And that's known as the sectoral balance approach. This divides the economy into three sectors. The private sector, which is both households and firms. The rest of the world and the government. If the government is in def the government is in blue. If the government is in deficit, it shows negative here, below the zero line. If a sector is in surplus, it shows above the zero line. Now, the first thing to note is that the surpluses and deficits of all three sectors have to cancel out. And this is why the whole thing is a mirror image graph. Where there's a peak above, there's always a peak below. Where there's a peak above, a peak below. A trough above, there's a trough below. These are because the sectors, sectoral balances must sum to zero. Because debts are always between these agents. We're only considering the debts between these three categories of agents. Now, the important point to notice is that the government has been running a large deficit. It's been running a large deficit since about 2000. 
And over the same period, the rest of the world has been running a large surplus. There was a brief period when there was plenty of oil, when the rest of the world didn't run a surplus with respect to Britain. But over most of the period, the rest of the world has been running a surplus. In other words, Britain as a whole has been running a deficit. Now, so long as there's a trade deficit, the government can only reduce its own deficit by forcing the private sector into debt. This takes the form either of individuals running up their credit card and mortgage debts, individuals selling off assets that are ultimately bought by foreigners. You can see the large-scale purchase of houses by foreign speculators in London, for example. Another form of deficit of the private sector is firms borrowing from abroad or firms selling off assets to foreign owners. So a lot of co companies like the water companies have passed into foreign ownership. Now let's look at what Reeves' sort of policies like cutting winter fuel allowances do. It affects all pensioners over £11,000, which is less than half the median income in Britain. So it's a, the threshold is extremely low. Now, how will this affect the trade deficit? It'll affect it very slightly if pensioners use less gas to heat their houses. There'll be lower gas imports, but only some of Britain's gas is imported. But... It follows that they'll also cut back on domestically produced goods and services, domestically produces e produced energy. So the re reduction in imports will be considerably less than the cut in incomes going to the pensioners. If they have savings, on the other hand, they can run down their savings to pay for heating. And to this extent, what the government does is shift part of its deficit onto the private sector. It shifts it onto those pensioners who are fortunate enough to have some savings. The problem is that the private sector has limit, cre limited credit, credit worthiness. You can only shift the borrowing onto the private sector for a short time. If the levels of credit taken up by the private sector get too high, you get a 2009-style credit crisis. It all seemed to be going well for Tony Blair and Gordon Brown until 2009. Secondly, the stock of assets that can be sold off to foreigners is now much lower than it was 25 years ago, when the big trade deficits really took off. And this is one reason why 14 years of Tory austerity really completely failed to eliminate the deficit. Let's zoom in on the last few years. Up until the COVID uh, crisis, the government deficit went along with rising private sector deficits, the yellow area here. There was a trade deficit to the rest of the world, red. The government reduced its deficit and shifted it onto the private sector. Then came Covid and the government, through the Bank of England, printed vast quantities of money to cover its expenditure over that period. The effect of, And also, due to supply chain issues, there was a significant reduction in imports. So the deficit to the rest of the world reduced somewhat. And having printed all that money, the private sector's cash surpluses built up. So you see a big rise in private sector cash surpluses over those years. Now, how can a nation's national debt be reduced? Well, basically, there are only three ways of doing it. You can repudiate the national debt. 
you can tax it out of existence or you can export enough to pay it off. You can get a fast repudiation, as the Russians did in 1917, by simply repudiate all debts incurred by previous governments. You can slowly repudiate it by allowing inflation. Blue line here shows the British national debt. Shoots up during the First World War, shoots up during the Second World War, and then exponentially declines in the post-war period. Now, most of that decline is due to the exponential decline in the value of the pound. The national debt is denominated in pounds, has to be paid back in pounds, and if the pounds are worth a fraction of what they were when they were borrowed, the national debt as a percentage of GDP therefore falls. So there's many ways to skin a cat. Wilson may not have been as radical as Lenin, but he did greatly reduce the national debt. By the end of his period, the national debt had been really reduced a great deal. The other way to deal with it is by taxation. The national debt is in the form of bonds, which are owned either by rich individuals or by banks. To cancel it, you have to be able to tax those who actually hold the bonds, either people who own them directly or hold big cash balances in the banks, which are backed by bonds. Essentially, this means what you have to have over time is a confiscatory level of taxation on large estates so that those who have large financial assets have to run them down year by year due to taxation. You can never do it by cutting expenditure going to people who don't hold bonds or don't have big bank accounts. You can only do it by cancelling credits that those who own the government debt have. The other way of doing it is by exporting. If a state has no colonies, it can't directly tax foreigners, including taxing those who hold the national debt. Now, obviously, prior to Indian independence, the British state could tax India. So that was a significant source of revenue. But afterwards, it can only tax them indirectly by selling them exports on whose production it had previously levied taxes. If it does this, the state can eventually become a net creditor, not a net debtor. Most obvious example of that in Europe is Norway which taxes oil exports and has built a huge sovereign asset fund run having a big debt. So a long-term policy of reducing rather than repudiating the national debt actually requires a state to run a trade surplus. And that is just as relevant for the USA as it is for Britain. But this is completely absent from the plans Reeves is putting forward. There is no plan to eliminate the trade deficit. To do it would require the deliberate devaluation of the pound alongside raising the share of national income going as investment. Now, the deliberate devaluation of the pound was made impossible by Gordon Brown making the Bank of England independent. So it would actually require legislation to remove the independence of the Bank of England. And raising the share of national income going as investment is ruled out by the fact that the government continues the Thatcherite doctrine that the private sector has to be what does the investment. And we know from past experience 
that the private sector will not invest sufficiently. The countries which have high investment at the moment, like China, are able to do it because a large part of the economy is owned by the state. Because they are basically state capitalist economies. When Britain had high levels of investment compared to now, in the 50s and 60s, it was when there was a large share of state capitalism in the economy. And to have continued it, they would have had to have increased the state capitalist share. But we know that didn't happen. So, basically I'm saying the strategy of austerity, a strategy which failed in the 1930s, a strategy which has failed under the Tories since 2009, if that is pursued by the Starmer government, it will fail again.